Uh, yeah, I'm John Capdevila. I'm a data scientist at Zoe. And uh, the title is uh, called uh, Mapping COVID-19. There is an app for that. And the app that we are talking about is the COVID Symptom Study app, which was launched uh, back in March, uh, uh, right before uh, the lockdown in the UK. So I'd like to start with, uh, uh, with the story, to tell you the story about behind this app. Uh, this app uh, was initially funded entirely by Zoe. Zoe is a nutrition and healthcare uh, company uh, located in uh, London and also has offices in uh, Boston. And uh, this app was uh, first built over a weekend. So we uh, created a squad of data engineers, uh, software engineers and scientists, which came up with the first uh, version of this app on the weekend of the 21st and the 22nd of March. And the app was finally launched on the 24th of March. Uh, right before uh, the lockdown in the UK. Uh, days after the lockdown, uh, we saw uh, the app viralize, and in less than two weeks, we went from zero users to more than uh, 2 million users. And uh, currently, we have more than 4 million users across the UK, US, and Sweden. And uh, we have collected more than 170 million health reports. These are reports containing information about how you feel, which symptoms are you experiencing, but also we have collected more than 1 million test results from PCR test results to antigen test results or antibody test results, which are meant to uh, tell you whether you have COVID or whether you have had it. We have partnered with amazing scientists at King's College London, uh, MGH uh, Harvard and Lund University. With them, uh, we have disseminated all the knowledge that come out of this app, but we they have also helped us massively to roll out uh, this uh, uh, app into the different countries. Moreover, we are sharing uh, the anonymized data uh, for research purposes via the ATR UK, so any scientist can uh, do research with this data. On a daily basis, we are informing the UK government through SAGE, so we are sending uh, them uh, stats on uh, incidence and prevalence estimates, and also a list of uh, hotspot areas, as well as other information which is relevant uh, for uh, tracking this disease. Finally, I must say that we are now funded by the UK government to continue supporting uh, this app until uh, the pandemic is over. So for those that uh, haven't seen the COVID symptom study app, it's a very simple app in which uh, you create an account and then uh, straight away, you can start reporting how you are feeling. Uh, you can report symptoms for yourself or you can report for another. And, uh, and this was a very interesting feature that we uh, released because um, uh, the app penetration is usually uh, uh, lower in certain age groups. And uh, with uh, this uh, feature, basically we enable to get uh, data from the elderly and also children which uh, usually is hard uh, to get. Then you are asked um, to enter your symptoms. What are you suffering? We have a list of 20 symptoms. Some of them are positively correlated with uh, COVID. Some others are not. Uh, so uh, we can understand uh, whether you are having uh, COVID from these symptoms or, what, or whether you have uh, other, uh, another disease. Uh, the app also prompts you to enter your tests uh, your COVID test, and uh, you can enter as many as you want, and you have also to uh, uh, enter the test uh, outcome and result. And finally, there is a sharing functionality, which help us massively, like at the start of the pandemic, because uh, through this functionality, we uh, uh, our early adopters could uh, reach out to the networks and, uh, and um, evangelize about the app and how uh, cool it was and how easy was uh, 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 to be used. As I said, uh, we have partnered with uh, King's College, MGH, and LAN, and we have disseminated um, research in top tier journals like Nature Medicine, uh, Science, and the Public Lancet, among uh, many others. And we hope that uh, we can continue this collaboration because we are still collecting useful data to understand not only um, people who are suffering now uh, um, from COVID, but people who in the future will have um, also long-term effects of this uh, COVID uh, 
uh, this is. So to get you to understand a little bit the data that we collect from a spatial point of view, uh, we've put together these maps in which uh, we show different uh, aspects of the data that we collect, like for example, the number of users on the first uh, chart, on the first map at the top, also um, like the symptoms, like the prevalence of any of the symptoms, uh, which allow us to understand where like people with symptoms is in the country. Um, also um, complex combinations of these symptoms, which are sometimes predictive of uh, COVID. And also we can also plot across uh, space, uh, all the information that we get from uh, testing. So um, people who has been tested, those who have uh, reported positive and those who have reported negative test results. But we believe that uh, the most interesting insight is when we cross this data. Once we cross like symptom data with testing data, we are able to expand uh, um, the functionalities and the insights that we get from this data uh, uh, to people who hasn't been tested. So basically, when we cross this information, uh, we can uh, show things like the following, where here basically I'm uh, showing a list of uh, the top 10 symptoms ordered by recall. Recall is basically how uh, prevalent uh, each of these symptoms is among people who tested positive. And uh, also uh, we report precision. And what this table says basically is that um, there are like three symptoms like fatigue, headaches or throat, which are very common among people who tested positive, right? Uh, but these three symptoms are also common for other diseases. So they have like a very low precision. But then we have another list of symptoms like loss of taste, smell, persistent cough and fever, which have like a moderate recall. So like they are, uh, less common uh, than the other uh, symptoms, but they have like a higher precision. And basically for those that are in the UK, you, you, must, uh, you might know that the NHS uh, UK here is checking exactly for these three symptoms. At the start, they were only checking for fever and persistent cough, but after some time, when all the evidence, all the scientific evidence uh, 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 was uh, clear, uh, they uh, also introduced loss of taste and smell because clearly, as we show in this uh, table, is a symptom which is very uh, prevalent pe among people who tested positive, but it's also very specific of uh, COVID-19. So as I was saying, when we cross like the information of symptoms uh, together with information of test results, we can start like doing uh, more interesting things that can be uh, uh, um, conveyed to the users in a more easy way. And one of the things that we've been doing is basically build predictions uh, from these symptoms. So at the beginning, when like testing was not massively available, uh, users could still introduce uh, symptoms in uh, into the mo into the app, and uh, we uh, get um, 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 a test result for those users that were tested, and we could build a prediction model which uh, predicted uh, for uh, people who haven't had a test. And with this uh, with this prediction model, which is in fact the one that we published in Nature together with with KCL and the other research partners, then uh, we have an estimate of how many people. Uh, have uh, COVID in the population of the app. Then if we plug this together with another module that we call the extrapolation module, and we use demographic data from these countries, from UK, US, and Sweden, what we can produce is an estimate of how many in, uh, people in the country is suffering uh, from, uh, from COVID at a certain point of time. And that, that information was uh, very, in, uh, the, this, the, this, um, this model was very useful at the point that we didn't have enough uh, testing because it allowed us to uh, explain what was happening across the country. And here uh, I show that we build like interactive maps uh, thanks to our uh, uh, partner uh, Carto, which granted us uh, um, a premium account in order to be able to uh, draw uh, these interactive maps in which users could um, um, explore uh, the different uh, areas of the country, and they could uh, understand also uh, which were the estimated uh, rates for each of the local authorities. Uh, and uh, not only that, once we put several maps together, 
we could understand how uh, the pandemic uh, evolved over time. And that was uh, something that we did at the beginning when uh, there was no uh, enough testing, but uh, um, it allowed us to understand how the um, uh, how the pandemic peaked like early April and how like with the uh, lockdown measures, we were able to control uh, the pandemic uh, uh, by the end of May. Um, during summer, um, these predictions that we got from symptoms, they were also very useful to understand what was going on uh, in the different uh, uh, local authorities across UK. So basically, uh, because everything um, had a low number of cases, we were able to um, uh, use uh, cases reported through the app and also um, symptoms reported through the app to understand which local authorities could uh, be in a situation of, uh, of outbreak and basically highlighting them and uh, informing the government so they could take measures like, for example, increasing testing, or if then they realized that there was a real problem in that uh, local authority, introduce a local lockdown measures. So um, all this information um, was uh, very useful to provide, uh, uh, to give it back to um, to uh, policymakers, but we've been also giving uh, back information to our users, like, for example, information uh, just playing back information that they have introduced in the app, like uh, percentages of uh, specific uh, combinations of symptoms across different age groups or uh, uh, across the whole population. And lately, uh, we're working uh, to improve also uh, the engagement of users in the app by introducing more personalized insights in the app, like, for example, the personalized maps, which are um, uh, personalized to the location of the user. In this way, um, we believe that we can give uh, some uh, more meaningful insights to users and keep them engaged uh, with the use of the app. Um, to conclude, I'd like to also um, tell you a little about some of the uh, um, uh, projects that we've been running uh, in which we try to connect users to research uh, studies and clinical trials. Uh, um, to basically help uh, help saving lives. Uh, so, for example, uh, we've worked with the NHS uh, blood transplant uh, program in which uh, they are taking plasma donations from people who have recovered from COVID, and this uh, plasma uh, uh, then um, um, they extract antibodies in order to create treatments for coronavirus patients. And uh, we've, do we've done something similar with the principal trial, which is a uh, a trial run by the University of Oxford, in which uh, they are developing treatments for population over 50, and uh, which can be taken at home. And finally, um, we have opened up a, a vaccine registry with more than 800,000 users uh, uh, registered now who have expressed the desire to be contacted to participate in, in vaccine trials. And currently, uh, we are working with them to see uh, if uh, uh, people would be interested in participating on these trials and helping uh, the development of the disease. So on all these uh, different uh, collaborations with different entities, um, there's been always uh, um, um, like the data analysis part of like um, um, selecting um, individuals with a specific characteristics. And one of the characteristics has always been like uh, like regional proximity to, te to uh, testing centers or to uh, treatment facilities so they can uh, actually go and participate uh, to these studies. So spatial queries have been key also uh, to uh, put uh, users in touch with these uh, research studies and clinical trials. And that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And I'd like to um, say that uh, at Zoe, we're recruiting. We're recruiting data engineers, uh, software engineers, uh, among many other roles. So anyone interested, please uh, check out. Thank you. Joanne, thank you very much for walking us through uh, the, the story of the app. It's really fascinating. Um, we've got some questions from, from the audience, so I'm, I'm going to kick off with the first one. Um, so Gareth Griffith has asked, how do you model selection processes for the voluntary user base to be able 
to generalize out to it sorry to enable generalization out of sample population to for instance extrapolate to nationwide cases over time uh, so it's, uh, gareth says the css has been shown to be over ascertained for less deprived and more educated populations right yeah that's that's completely fair that's that's a really good question thank you very much and um, uh, basically um, what we do, uh, I think when, when I was explaining, we have this extrapolation module in which we go from the app population to the UK population. And there, what we do is to stratify by different sociodemographic factors. And three of these sociodemographic factors are age, uh, sex, and also uh, deprivation index. Uh, so basically, uh, people who is more deprived, as you were saying, uh, is underrepresented in, in these apps. And basically, they are weighted up uh in these estimates these are estimates they are not never perfect but we are controlling for this uh um, selection bias fantastic thanks for explaining um we also it's, it's more of a, a comment than a question here and i'm going to build on it so stuart norris saying really well done for setting this up so fast and with, with limited resources i mean i think it's amazing as well and there's been plenty of countries where you've seen tech companies do similar things. In fact, at Carter, we worked on a similar project uh, in Madrid with the with the local government, and and it was it was a great success also. Um, but the question I wanted to ask you, Juan, is uh, based on the success that you've had in the UK, did you have other countries reaching out to you to see if you could collaborate from a code perspective, or they wanted help on certain points? And what were the points that they wanted help on? Thank you. So also a very good question. We had many countries contacting us um, to roll out like uh, versions of the app in like uh, Australia, South Africa, other English speaking uh, countries. Um, 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 but we we end up rolling out uh, this app in, in the US uh, together with MGH uh, Harbor and also in Sweden together with Land University. And uh, this has been like the two main countries where uh, we thought that there was an interest from a scientific point of view. For example, Sweden had uh, almost no lockdown. So we wanted to understand, uh, or our scientists wanted to understand uh, what is the impact of not having a lockdown. And uh, in the US also, uh, uh, we uh, it's a massive country with a lot of diversity and also like the policies at that point were not so clear. So we thought it was also a very interesting use case uh, from a research point of view. And um, and, and the reality is that um, in the US, uh, it take up very well. And we have uh, still like a good amount of daily users uh, reporting in the US and like uh, our science teams are doing a great job from this data. Uh, but we haven't engaged as much as we did in the UK with the uh, government and, and the uh, public uh, entities to first like um, um, offer testing to the users of the app who show symptoms. That's one of the things that we do. And uh, this has allowed us to also scale like the data that we collect because it allows us to understand, okay, for, from these people who had symptoms, uh, um, were that actually uh, COVID tests, uh, COVID um, positive or not. Uh, so on these other countries, we didn't manage like uh, to establish this relationship with the public uh, organism to um, pro probably to push that uh, and move this forward. Awesome. The, the power of collaboration. That's awesome. Um, and then we have a question here from Phil Barty. And it's a very relevant question based on some uh, research published around, around long COVID yesterday. Um, Phil says, do you continue tracking the details of those that have had COVID to learn more about the long recovery some that experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's probably going to be one of the main objectives of the app moving forward, because a lot of people is going to be suffering uh, long term effects of COVID. And basically, we want to keep them uh, logging the symptoms to understand how, um, which is the impact, which is the real impact of COVID, and um, and, and 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 that's going to be uh, probably a core that we're going to follow in the future. Fantastic. Um, and another question, one um, with the NHS COVID app that's been released, Track and Trace. Uh, are you having any collaboration with the NHS at all? Is there any potential collaboration between Zoe uh, and, and the, the government on that? Uh, no, not really. There are two different uh, apps. Uh, one is a track and trace app, as you say, and the other is a symptom logger. Uh, 
so like the objective of both are completely different. Um, we are not um, tracking people in order to um, identify uh, contacts. Uh, we are more interested in like collecting the data to share it with the scientists and also uh, and then share these insights that come from uh, the scientific evidence. Uh, so I think that's more our objective. While the NHS uh, Track and Trace app is more an operational app, which uh, is be uh, it's very important to um, prevent outbreaks, uh, but has a different purpose. Yeah. Um, and then we have another question here from Theodore Reuter. Uh, who asks, how did you handle any areas of the UK with very slow sampling rates, i.e. app responses? Yeah, thank you for this question. So th that that's always a challenge, right? So um, in our maps, you can uh, see some of the time that we report that we don't have enough contributors uh, to give an, uh, an accurate estimate. And that's basically the reason. Uh, we are trying to invite more people from those areas to share uh with uh, the family the friends so we can get uh, something uh which is meaningful to them but it's always a challenge and basically uh we've been very conservative on uh, graying out everything that we don't feel confident enough cool thank you for that uh, then we have another question here from Raffaele pranzo who asked did you encounter any problems with compatibilities with many different devices used by the population Definitely, definitely. So our customer support is uh, uh, is bombarded with questions about uh, things that are not being uh, rendered properly in one device or in the other. So that's a common thing that I guess at any app uh, that is aimed to have like a, a public so diverse like uh, the COVID symptom app uh, has uh, to face, and we had uh, a lot of issues. But I think that uh, we managed to. Um, um, we managed to um, cover most of them, I would say. Okay, um, and what, one question um, on cartography. So uh, it was very early on in the process that you started publishing maps. Um, do you have anybody within your team at Zoe who's focused on the cartography side of things or have you guys been learning spatial as you go along? We've been learning a special as, uh, as we go along, definitely. Um, so as I said at the beginning, we were not in this business. We were in nutrition, uh, um, so it's in nutrition. And basically the reason why we launched this app is because in nutrition, uh, we do kind of similar studies in we, which we collect like um, uh, health data from people participating in research studies. And we saw an opportunity to uh, launch this app, which uh, I mean, it was not our field, and then uh, we needed to like give back the data to users and we need to play it back and uh, we didn't think of a better way than uh, do that uh, in, a, in a map because everyone wants to know what's happening near them more when you are in lockdown and uh, you are not traveling and you basically want to just have the information of what's happening near you. So that was, uh, we didn't have anyone and we learned uh, in the process. Absolutely. I think it's so important, the cartography side of things. I, I said to Joanne backstage before that I actually know lots of people who've been sharing the maps with their parents to make sure that they comply with lockdown and share those insights. So I think it's been a really powerful tool for, for the entire population. It's very impressive. Um, we do have a, another question here, which has come through from William Hinton. Um, and he says, there is not enough data to train a model for long-term effects because you only have eight to 10 months. What are some long-term effects this is a bit of a difficult question because um nobody really knows long long term yet uh, but i don't know how you would answer that one yuan yeah definitely it's a challenge right we we had a challenge at the beginning when we didn't have enough uh, data to uh to train a model to predict uh, covid so basically uh, we end up with simple models um uh, that uh, generalize well but uh, uh, definitely um we cannot predict what's going to happen uh, in uh, nine months time uh, so um, um, yeah I, I haven't I haven't been so involved in the long-term um, COVID uh, project but I know that my uh, colleagues at KCL uh, basically uh, um, have um, um, have encountered this um, problem and uh, they uh, basically um, um, look at the data 
uh, with models with low complexity rather than assuming a very complex model, which is likely to overfit. Okay, great. Well, um, I don't think, if you have any more questions, please feel free to share them in the chat. Uh, I'm sure Juan will be able to uh, participate there. Um, Juan, thank you so much for taking the time. I realize it must be very busy for you uh, with everything that's going on. So we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to the spatial data science community. Um, uh, Yuan's uh, talk will be available online, so if you want to share this with anybody uh, in your communities or in your companies, uh, please feel free to do so. And uh, keep up the great work, Yuan, and we're looking forward to hearing more about your projects in the future. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um...